everybody. It's great to have here a panel of distinguished speakers and an audience, and even more importantly, um, an audience in the wider world connected to us via Zoom. We are here this evening to discuss, but actually really to celebrate um, a very important book, Emmanuel Senici's Music in the Present Tense. I'm going to say a few words about this book in a minute. I first want to give a little bit of context. So basically, the Bolletino del Centro Rossignano di Studi has commissioned a roundtable to discuss Emanuele's very important contribution to Rossini um, studies, which I had the honor to curate. And we collected some, we brought together some scholars from different disciplines to discuss Emanuele's book. And on this um, edition of Recent Globes Druckfrisch, Tonight, we are going to present a short version of this roundtable. And I would like to start with a few thanks. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the recent GLOBE, the very important center for globalization studies here at the University of Leipzig. And they have a series called Druckfrisch, and they are hosting this um, event um, tonight. Um, I'm grateful um, to the Fondazione Rossini, especially Ilaria Narici and Daniele Carnini for collaborating with us on the organization of this roundtable. I'm, of course, very grateful to the Bolletino del Centro Rossignano di Studi um, um, and here in particular the two editors, Celine Frigo Manning and um, from Lyon 3 and Matteo Giugioli from Roma 3 for um, inviting us to contribute this discussion on Emanuele's um, book. And of course, I'm grateful to the European Research Council for um, supporting this event financially. So this is within the framework of our ESC project, Operant the Politics um, of Empire in Habsburg Europe. And as usual, we wouldn't have been able to organize this event without the support of Frau Dr. von Erzen Becker. I now briefly want to present you our host for the discussion. To my left, you see Dr. Barbara Babic. She is a postdoc within the ERC project. She was previously an assistant professor at Vienna and a long-standing collaborator of the Fondazione Rossini, especially in the field of the edition of the Carteggio. And this is, of course, a knowledge and experience that he, she now contributes also, among other things, to our project, where she mostly looks at opera in the Habsburg um, Empire in southeastern Adriatic. Further to my left is Dr. Alessandro um, de Arcangelis. He is a lecturer in history at University College London. He is a historian of political thought. He's particularly interested in the, the semantics of time, um, Hegelian debates, Italian Hegelianism, and many um, related topics where he follows an approach that tries to globalize the history of political thought and intellectual history. To my right, is um, Professor Catherine Hambridge. She teaches musicology at Durham and was previously at Rorick. And she's a specialist on music theater in the Napoleonic era, worked like Barbara also on melodrama. And um, one particular field of her interest is musical romanticism. And then, of course, the main protagonist of the evening here to my right, Professor Emanuele Senici. He's professor of music at La Sapienza and author of the book we are going to discuss. He was previously at Cornell and at Oxford. And in addition to his work on Rossini and on Puccini, he has written on a wonderful book on Mozart's Clemenza di Tito. He has written on gender and landscape in opera and on many other things. My name is Axel Körner and I'm the PI on the ERC project on opera in Habsburg um, Europe, and I have a chair here at Leipzig University in cultural and intellectual history. So this was a long round of introductions, and I first want to say um, a few words about the book and about the purpose of this roundtable. I think what we discuss here tonight is the most important book on Rossini in years, and this is probably the most important book in English on Rossini since the Cambridge Companion to Rossini, also edited, of course, by Emanuele Senici. I think what makes this book special is the contextual reading of Rossini's operas 
And this is really what makes the book, I think, the game changer in existing work on Rossini. The focus is on Rossini's Italian operas, largely during the Napoleonic years, and the ways these works were conceived, performed, seen and heard and discussed by people at the time. This very wide and therefore unusual approach to Rossini, we thought, merits a discussion that is a bit more profound, perhaps, than is customary in the most important journal in Rossini studies, which is the Bolletino del Centro Rossiniano di Studi in Pesaro. And um, we conceived of this discussion in form of a roundtable that wasn't meant to present you just with the ideas of the established grandees in um, opera studies or Rossini studies. Instead, we thought about authors of different generations, of different disciplines, of different national backgrounds, and who present um, the readers of the Bolletino and our audience tonight with thematic reading of the book. So we distributed a number of different themes basically to the authors and they responded to Emmanuel's book um, in the perspective of these themes that we thought about. In addition to the authors that you see here tonight, there's also Carlotta Ferrara de Uberti from Pisa University, who looks at Emmanuel's book in the context of Risorgimento historiography. And we also commissioned a piece by the musicologist Jutta Tölle from Klagenfurt, who read the book as a contribution to opera studies. Barbara Babich read Emanuel's book in the context of Rossini biography, how the topic of Rossini biography has been approached in recent decades. Alessandro thinks about the book as a contribution to thoughts on the semantics of historical time, so picking up on a theme that before Emanuele also um, Benjamin Walton had already um, thought about it, so modernity and Rossini studies. Catherine read the book in the context of what it can tell us about the Napoleonic period and the context of music in the Napoleonic um, period. And I looked at Emanuele's book more from a perspective of Italian studies and what it tells us about how Europeans and Italians discussed Italy's so-called otherness. In what follows now, the um, authors of the roundtable who wrote these different contributions will present here a short version of the papers that they produced for the Bolletino. And so this is an issue of the Bolletino, which should be published this summer in time for the Rossini Festival in Pesaro. And this short presentation of their contributions will then be followed by a response by the author. And we hope then to engage in discussion with questions from the floor, comments from the floor, and of course also from people who want to participate and contribute via Zoom. And now before I hand over to Barbara, I only wanted to once more mention the wonderful technical assistance that we always get from Recent Globe with the events of our project, and here in particular Justus Wenke and Roman Kabielski, who basically run the show for us from a technical point of view. So thank you very much again for being here with us. And then I hand over to Barbara to present us with her ideas. Yeah, thank you so much, Axel. I am very glad to be part of this round table uh, and celebrate Emanuele Senich's outstanding book today with you all in Leipzig, with our colleagues online and with all institutions behind this event. The title of my short review is Vite di Rossini. And so I, of course, wink at the famous Vita Rossini, written by Stendhal almost 200 years ago. But I especially refer to the many different ways, possibilities that we, scholars of the present tense, have when we engage with Rossini's many lives and biographies. My aim was basically to place Emanuele's book among other scholarly work on Rossini published over the 20 past years to detect how he used sources and documents and eventually to find out what makes this book so special in its mixture between a monographic work on Rossini and a cultural history on early 19th century Italy. As we all know, and especially here in Leipzig, Rossini has spent much time abroad recently. In the last 10 years, opera studies have really embraced 
new perspectives from the global and transnational history to show how Italian opera moved around and moved audiences all around the world. Um, the recent uh, volume edited by Axel Körner and Paolo Kühl brilliantly investigates really these notions. Yet, I really think that with his book, Emanuele wanted somehow to bring Rossini not only back to his present, but more importantly, back home. Music in the present tense explores the role of Rossini's music in different Italian centers between 1810 and 1825, stressing both its striking popularity and its progressive decline. His contribution covers the years just before Benjamin Walton's Rossini Restoration Paris, and these words really nicely resonate together. In fact, both scholars explore similar categories, such as modernity, noise, style, memory, and so on. Yet, really, these concepts or discourses are at the core of the 15 short chapters of Emanuele's book, and this is indeed a very original way to conceive this volume, not only proceeding by chronology or by geography, as, for instance, in the rather standard or classical biographies by Richard Osborne and Paolo Fabri. This book is not only about Rossini. Readers gain, for example, many insights into the role of other less known composers, such as Generali, Guglielmi, Pacini, Pavesi, and into the ideas and opinions of Rossini supporters and critics. In working with biographical information, Emanuele moves the spotlight away from the facts and narratives we all know. To put it in a nutshell, he really demonstrates that it is possible to write on Rossini in Italy without even mentioning Domenico Barbaglia, who is the great absent of this book. Music in the present tense engages not only with operatic life, social life, and networks around Rossini, but also with the inner intimate, emotional life of the characters that animate this book. I feel that the key that Emanuela used to access this rather ephemeral aspect can be found in the letters, as the medium par excellence to communicate ideas and feelings with the outside world. Different kinds of letters link the two parts of the book. We find Rossini's own letters that surprisingly reveal less information on the composer's intentions. We have the Lettere Manifesto by Giuseppe Carpani as passionate endorsement, love declaration for Rossini. The letters published in the press, in the case by Pietro Guglielmi in Milan. But more importantly, the writings by Giacomo Leopardi and Ugo Foscolo. Indeed, his Le Ultime Lettere di Jacopo Ortiz reinforces to us the sense of the mood and the inner life of people who went through the trauma of the Napoleonic Wars, who experienced the shock of the arrival of the modernity, the feeling of being disconnected with the reality, and reflected on how to perform in a new time. Somehow dealing with lives in this era means also speaking about death and rebirth of a whole European generation. And it's especially moving uh, and thought provoking to read about the sense of, I quote, feeling trapped in the present, given our current times of struggle because of the war, overwhelming global events we experienced in the past two years and nowadays. So, to paraphrase Emanuele, the book speaks about those lives back then, but also in a certain way about us and our time. And it explores different reasons that bring us to move on in times of crisis and choose the theater as a space of human experience. Beyond entertainment, Rossini's opera emerges as being sometimes the path towards healing, or what Freud would call a moment of 
compromise formation where opposite elements, uh, fear and freedom, desire and defense are acted out. So to conclude, by tracing Rossini's life from the theatrical birth to his, uh, I'm sorry, to his progressive death from stage, Emanuele has shown us a new way of looking at the common refrains that have been chasing Rossini's lives for so long by sometime putting discourses upside down. Just to mention a few keywords of the book, repetition can be original and therapeutical, and the inner silence can be sometimes loud as noise. Thank you. So second speaker, the round table will be Alessandro Viacangelis from London, and he's going to speak about the Emanuele's book and Semantics of Time. Okay. Thank you, Axel, um, for your kind invite, for your introduction, and thank you, Barbara, for touching upon some really interesting topics which I'm very, very happy to be able to expand on. So, um, I'm a historian of ideas. I felt initially quite unqualified to comment on a book that talks about Rossini, but as Barbara has already said, this is a book that speaks to many different types of uh, academics and readers. Um, and as an intellectual historian, I did find plenty of truly thought-provoking intuitions within this book. And this is what I would like to um, tell you a little bit about. So even though this is a book that's conceived as a monograph on Rossini's operas, music in the present tense felt above all like a masterclass on how to disrupt some deeply rooted teleological assumptions that still today underpin our historical understanding of the intellectual history of the Risorgimento. So central to the book is the thesis that um, um, Rossini's operas reflected Italians' deeply traumatic encounter with modernity. So according to the author, uh, the arrival of Napoleon's armies in 1796 ushered in two decades of unprecedented and near constant political, economic, social and cultural changes, which found Italians wholly unprepared. So these traumatic experiences resulted in new perceptions of space and time, of history and geography, rapidly shifting political borders, a sudden break with the Italian state's past, coupled with the impossibility of imagining a bright future under the current circumstances, meant that life became restricted to the present. To quote the author, as if the present were the only temporal dimension available to human subjects. So against this background, music in the present tense shows how, like many of the European peers, Italians resorted to alternative and non-literary forms of expression uh, and platforms to sublimate their deeply turbulent meeting with modernity. So spectacles, public promenading, religious ceremonies, and theatrical entertainment. So in this context, the heightened theatricality that permeates Rossini's operas is best understood as a response to a world that felt trapped in the present and as evidence of Italians' inability to work through the trauma of modernity. I feel like the trauma was a concept that we've already touched upon. So in this book, Emanuele embraces a markedly Kozelekian perspective, and I found this truly uh, intriguing, and I think that we need more historians that do this type of work. So a truly Kozelekian perspective in regarding crisis as a structural signature of Italian modernity. And yet, while the German historian characterized crisis as historical time accelerating and spiraling out of control, music in the present tense emphasizes what one might call a drastic deceleration of historical time. The intellectual history of the Risorgimento actually shows many sort of case studies that can support this intuition. You can actually see it, you know, when reflecting on their position vis-a-vis -vis distinctly European dimensions of cultural, socioeconomic and political life, many, many 19th century intellectuals voiced this sense of temporal stasis. So in this context, Italians' once glorious past could no longer function as a means of negotiating a vantage point in the life of modern European nations. 
the future appears uncertain and bleak. And you can see it in, in many, many contexts. I'm thinking about uh, Vincenzo Cuoco's critique of how Neapolitans had received um, French revolutionary thought in 1799. You can see it in 1843 when Vincenzo Gioberti complained that uh, uh, the church no longer played the critical role in Italian politics, which in a way undermined Italy's position at the heart of the Catholic world. And you can see it in the writings of Bertrando Spaventa, who explained how in the 19th century, Italian philosophy felt like little more than a uh, formerly glorious footnote in this European landscape, which was dominated by German authors. So according to Professor Senishi, the same anxieties can be read in, for example, Ugo Foscolo's um, Ultime Lettere di Jacopo Ortis. Uh, as well as Giacomo Leopardi's 1824 Discorso Sopra lo Stato Presente dei Costumi degli Italiani. Uh, the former, the author claims, voiced the true malaise of modernity that originated in the aftermath of the French Revolution and placed particular emphasis on the fall of the Venetian Republic. Um, Foscolo's epistolary novel documented a radical crisis that was caused by the loss of faith in revolutionary utopias and the ensuing psychological and emotional trauma. Similarly, Leopardi's discourse, or ref, uh, discourse or reflected on Italians' encounter with modernity and identified the lack of a cohesive public opinion and of solid moral foundations as the source of, quote, uh, in the, uh, indifference, cynicism, and contempt for everybody and everything that made 19th century Italy the land of nothingness, of meaninglessness, and of death. So viewed from this perspective, I found this book to be a thought-provoking intervention in critical debates in Italian political thought. By portraying Rossini as a composer who soundtracked the troubled ways in which Italians navigated their jarring experience of historical time, um, faced this sort of temporal rupture with the past, and in, in a way exercised their anxieties about the future, Music as the present tense functions as the conceptual antithesis to those age-old narratives that construct Italian's quest for modernity as a panegyric of the realization of the nation state and as drawing out of particular dialectics of state and civil society. And of course, I'm referring to those uh, interpretations that begin with Croce and Gentile, ideas of how much liberty does the modern state grant us or how much liberty does the modern state curtail? So the two left sort of liberal and uh, conservative interpretations of Hegel, of course. Um, so a focus on, thanks to its focus on temporal change and shifting historical semantics, uh, music in the present tense, especially in the second half, is able to take issue with these perspectives and to point at their inability to capture the disruptive and traumatic effects of modernity in 19th century Italy. So as they anchor, on the one hand, the modern historical experience within the paradigm of the Italian nation state, and posit, on the other, a direct continuity between the temporal regimes of the Renaissance, of course, Machiavelli's political ideas, and the Risorgimento, these traditional verdicts are blind to the extent to which uh, Italians encountered with modernity ushered in truly dramatic shifts in their conceptions of space and time, rendering them unknowable dimensions for a subject who had lost, to use the author's own words, all notions of itself as a separate and unified entity. So it is therefore as a means of overcoming these deficiencies stemming from teleological interpretations of Italian history that thinking of modernity in terms of a radical fracture rather than continuity between past and future may be, in my view, useful and illuminating. In the author's own words, it seems more appropriate to speak of a historical rupture rather than junction. So I'm coming to the end of my brief talk here. So these teleological narratives have, uh, uh, in my view, profound implications as regards the collision of the political and the cultural history of 19th century Italy. Chief among these is the highly problematic proposition of a risorgimento canon denoting the body of works that uh, allegedly shaped a unified national culture underpinning the political unification of the peninsula. In this context, works by Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini were often constructed as mere footnotes to this canon, and as accomplishing little more than paving the way for none other than, of course, Giuseppe Verdi, 
whose operas were deemed to have soundtracked the process of national unification. So by portraying Rossini's operas as attempts to navigate an experience of crisis and negotiate these changing semantics of time, music in the present tense testifies to the hermeneutic limitations of these traditional verdicts on opera's, opera's role during the Risorgimento and shows how their shortcomings ultimately originate in these deeply, deeply teleological readings of Italian history. I think the teleological narratives of temporal continuity are not only problematic from historiographic and ideological standpoints, but as I've learned after reading this wonderful book, they are fundamentally incapable of grasping how much societies, their thoughts, and above all, their music change in time. Thank you very much. That's Alessandro. Then our next speaker will be Catherine Hambridge, who read Emanuele's book in the context of Napoleonic Europe. Thank you. I'd like to add my thanks um, to those already expressed, to the organisers here, Axel in particular, and to Emanuele um, for giving us the fodder uh, for this session. Um, I am inspired by Emanuele's evocative one-word chapter titles to choose two words on which I'm going to muse. Um, these words or ideas, they weren't chapter titles, um, but they are used throughout the book. Um, I think they're central to the argument. And for me, they yield some more questions in relation to how we understand the reaction of the Italian opera world to the trauma of the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars. And I should say that my musings absolutely reflect my biases as a scholar of French and German music theatre. So I hope you can excuse that. My words are escape and spectacle. And I'll start with escape. Musicologists have most commonly explored escapist responses to revolutionary and Napoleonic trauma in German romanticism, of course, in a sense of retreat from the inexplicable present into the past, into the ideal, into the natural, into the supernatural. We read in this wonderful book that Italians instead escaped into theatricality with Rossini's operas acting as a shield that could temporarily separate Italians from reality. In contrast to, say, E.T.A. Hoffman's pursuit of a convincing, internally coherent portrayal of a distinctly unreal world on stage to enable the spectator to be transported into those worlds, Rossini's music is emphatically not about sustaining the illusion, but about drawing attention to it, even breaking it by reveling in the artifice on stage. Hence, the non-representational tendency that you find in Rossini's style, most of all in his use of repetition, hence his use of noise to drown out the world outside the theatre, hence the knowing metatheatrical meta elements of Rossini's plots. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but if reveling in artifice is an escape from the world, what kind of escape is it? And what sort of spectatorship and audition does such an escape imply or require? The kind of sustained absorption that Hoffman promoted seems precluded in Rossini's theatre by the deliberate self-consciousness engendered by the metatheatrical and distancing gestures and by institutional practices and audience conventions and expectations. Michael Fried, after all, suggested that theatricality foregoes persuasiveness and dramatic illusion in the attempt to impress the beholder and solicit his applause, highlighting the long-standing theatrical opposition of absorption and theatricality. So I would ask if Rossini's opera's foreground non-mimesis and a dramaturgy that promoted distance, objectification and self-referentiality referentiality, terms which to me irresistibly recalled Brecht, of course, in the act of reading, what kind of mode of listening or spectatorship allows the, the, these operas to constitute a shield from reality? At various points, Emanuele refers to Italian spectatorship as constructed in opposition to attentive listening, as watching, not listening. And in that sense, I wondered perhaps we might see both on stage and off stage in the theatre as one experience of theatrical escape. There's also a hint in the book of a kind of passive audience abandonment engendered by the indistinct flux generated by the high degree of repetition. 
While it is easy for us, or perhaps for me, with my biases, to view some forms of spectatorship and listening as more escapist than others, because in being more absorbed by the stage, a spectator appears more separate from reality, I read in this book an invitation to think more about the middle ground between attentive and inattentive audience behaviour, and in particular to contemplate a kind of escapism not predicated on absorption. And now I come to spectacle. In the association of spectacle with theatricality, artifice, surface, and performance, then as now, to my somewhat literal-minded brain, the visual can sometimes get short shrift, literal meanings becoming secondary to the figurative. In music in the present tense, we read about the visual orientation of the Italians, their status as watched and watching doubly theatrical. The theatricality of Rossini's operas that comes through in this book resides for the most part in his music. And that made me wonder how the visual might participate in this model of theatricality. What visual artifice might have sustained the theatrical mode or highlighted it by undermining it even? So how do it Rossini's operas in their Italian performances relate to a discourse about spectacle on stage, if indeed there is such discourse as in France in this period. Um, and this thought came to me, not just because of my biases, but because of a link Emanuele <laughs> draws between the theatricality of Rossini's operas and melodrama, a genre that is both celebrated and castigated for the importance of the visual, and another post-revolutionary product the ambition and the extravagance of melodramatic set designs was often seen at the time as a marker of its superficiality by ungenerous critics. But I think we should be cautious about equating these ambitious visual effects with anti-mimetic theatricality. To be sure, the visual elements of a production could be advertised as attractions in themselves. One 1805 melodrama was listed as a melodrame héroïque en trois actes, a grand spectacle, orné de chants, danse, combat, évolution militaire, explosion, etc. But does this mean that the aesthetic was one of deliberate, conspicuous artifice or metatheatricality, as opposed to a realist depiction of an extreme scenario, which is often interpreted as a reenactment of revolutionary trauma? Indeed, in melodrama, I think it's hard to find the non-representational impulse that Emanuele locates in Rossini's music. As Peter Brooks famously argued, argued, all media tends to reinforce each other. Music times and expresses gestures which express the text, uh, somewhat uh, broadly painted there. But perhaps to our eyes, the excessively representative media combination draws attention to its theatricality. After all, the terms theatrical, operatic, and melodramatic are all used to indicate an excessive quality. But the excessively mimetic is not necessarily a disavowal of representation. And the issues raised by melodrama, melodrama even, or melodrama, could usefully be transferred back to Rossini, I think. What was the multimedia aesthetic in those early performances of Rossini? And how can it relate to the artifice or theatricality that Emanuele detects in the music? When the music was repeated, for example, were movements repeated, the bodies or scenery mechanized by the music? You can see my literal mind working here. Was the scenery representational? And if so, how might that have modified the music's artificial quality? Attending to performance practices, and to the literal spectacle of the visual on stage, in other words, might yield additional insights into how Rossini's operas provided an escape from or reenactment of the traumas of post-revolutionary Europe. Thank you, Catherine. Um, my remit in this round table and in reading collectively Emanuele's book was to think about Rossini and Italy's otherness, to think about debates on opera and concepts of national character, how debates on Rossini reflect ideas of Italianità in transnational and global context, and what Emanuele found out about this um, context and 
contribute with this research to um, these debates. And I have to admit that my reading of Emanuel's book in that moment when it came out was a little bit shaped also by the work we did at the time in the Reimagining Italianita um, project. What Emanuele um, produced is a thick description of um, Rossini's operas in their time, and um, it engages with constructions of Italy's otherness in contemporary debates on Rossini. So an important name in this is, of course, Germain de Stael, and her influence on Schlegel, on Leopardi and Stendhal, who are all protagonists of the different chapters, Stendhal being particularly interesting as one of Rossini's early biographers, but at the same time interesting because he had such a very different take on the Napoleonic experience compared to Germain de Stael. Senici places his book in this tradition of foreign readings of Italian national character, emphasizing the orientalizing nature of this practice. And as usually every word I pronounce on Emanuele's work is always a declaration of stima and love, I thought on that on this case, uh, occasion I present a slightly more critical reflection on interpretations that insist on the orientalizing nature of works such, such as um, Madame de Stael's Corinne or her writings on literature, to which Emanuele then refers in his analysis. Similar to authors including Roberto Dainotto and Silvana Patriarca, Emanuele insists on the orientalizing nature of de Stael's idea of Italians, which in the case of Leopardi, he then sees being internalized. Based on my own work on de Stael, but also my more recent reading and debates on Italian opera, I question whether authors such as de Stael really see Italians always as oriental others in the sense of Edward Said. I think this point is relevant to our understanding of Rossini's operas because it fundamentally changes our idea of the context to which they responded and which is at the very center of Emanuel's book. In my view, Saidian readings underestimate the contextual dimension of de Stael as a writer, as well as her weight as a political thinker. And I think a role plays there always that we downgrade her a little bit because she's a female political thinker um, in a period where mostly men were writing political thought. Much of what academics say about de Stael's idea of Italians is reductively based on books six and seven of Corinne ou l'Italie. Emanuele's book is also a book on Napoleonic Italy, and where de Stael writes about Italy, she doesn't do this to criticize how Napoleon's dictatorship contradicts the French Revolution's libertarian principles, but also Italy's republican and federal tradition, ideas precious to thinkers such as Constant, Filangeri, and Catania. So here my reflection links a little bit to the points that Alessandro raised earlier. When de Stael speaks of suppressed people, she speaks also about France itself, but in my view, she doesn't speak about Italians, and she doesn't speak about Italians' national character. This becomes especially clear when we observe her here in the environments of Leipzig, and in particular in Weimar, and in the ways she peers in the comments of Bertiga and others who witnessed her here. And I think this is interesting exactly because this period of Germain de Stael in Weimar immediately precedes her work on Italy and her travel to Italy, in which many of these ideas to which we refer also in operatic debates were then born. Contemporaries understood her rejection of Italy's fossilized classicism as a critique of France's empire style. Her invention of German Romanticism shared a similar purpose. All this matters to opera studies because it was Kauer's Singspiel Die Saalnixe, which she saw in Weimar, and that motivated her then to investigate Italy's fate under Napoleon. And the Na Saalnixe is something like an early version of Rosalka, we can perhaps say. And that's where this whole idea of a suppressed Italian comes from. Rossini then stands for the exact opposite of what she says about Italy's condition under Napoleon, but also shows that her intention was not to orientalize Italians. 
Vertica here in Weimar writes that the style not just asks, and I quote Vertica here, she listens carefully. She not only hears her own voice, but is serious about internalizing other opinions. She is a midwife of foreign ideas, he writes. The basis of her art was always abandon de soi-même. And I think it is this idea or that contemporaries expressed about her views that is relevant to our debates about orientalizing comments about Italians. And I think much of what we can actually discover in a closer reading of her work, but also of other authors writing about Italians and Italian music at the time, I would include Grillparzer here and also others, that these are ideas that actually don't fit with this image of the Western Orientalizer that um, we seem to have found so frequently in the past 20 years, scholarship um, where non-Italians write about Italian national character. And I think Emanuele's book makes a very important contribution, but maybe one on which we can also critically reflect. So thank you very much. And um, after, I thank you also for your patience of listening to four um, contributions, um, four different sets of thoughts on Emanuele's book. And I would now invite Emanuele to respond. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know where to begin with thanks, really. I'm extremely grateful. I'm moved, surprised, moved by these uh, responses, by the, the effort that has gone in organizing all this. Uh, I, I, I didn't think my book would be so interesting to people, basically. So I'm really very, very grateful to everybody. I should also add that this is the first time I hear all this. Because, for example, mm -hmm. Kathleen assumed that I read the, their contributions in advance. And, you know, this is it's the very first time I hear all this, so, which is great. I'm, I'm very <laughs> grateful and also surprised and, and challenged, in fact, mm -hmm. and challenged by this. So uh, whatever I have to say now is uh, sort of very provisional. It's what first comes to mind about your wonderful suggestions and contributions. So I'll start briefly with Barbara Babic's um, um, contributions about Rossini's life. It's interesting what you say about me wanting to bring, bring Rossini back home. In reality, he never left. We never left. These projects, projects like this, take a very long time to develop. And I gave the very first paper about this. I had no idea that there was a book there, but it was just a paper in 2005. In 2005, I don't think I'd ever heard the word transnational. You know, it was, it was before. So Rossini hadn't left Italy yet, hadn't gone transnational, as far as I was concerned. So uh, I was, I, rather than bringing him back, I was left behind. I mean, I was always there. And in the context of what happened to research between 2005 and 2019, when the book was published, um, of course, as it always happens, at some point you have to give up trying to write a book for the present. You have to write it for the past, for the recent past, or for the past. Uh, I would have, if I had to write the book, reconceive the book now, I would change it. I would write a different book. I would certainly uh, um, engage with the transnational aspects of Rossini's um, success and reception more significantly, more directly. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the Italian, the, 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 the location, also the, the, the perspective of the book. Um, uh, I will also want to say that uh, the book is not really about Rossini. You know, I have about two paragraphs when I say, <laughs> Uh, I don't care what he said, basically, you know, I quote a couple of letters, but it's about Italians and how they listened and that they watched, I can't do that, his operas. Um, so, uh, it, it's not really, my research is not really a research from the point of view of a composer, because I've been often criticized, or oh, you are yet again uh, offering a composer-centered uh, perspective, a composer center narrative, and I don't think I do. I, I think I think I'm, I talk about works and about people who are not primarily the composer. Uh, I I love what you had to say about letters, you know, the different letters. 
and it's worth, I don't know um, what I want to say, but I know there is some more to say about this uh, and about and why letters become so relevant in this kind of project. When um, I try to read into people's souls, basically, and the letter is a sort of fiction of intimacy or a performance of intimacy in that respect. Even I love that fake letter, the fake Rossini in 1826 in, 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 a, in a newspaper is made to say, ah, oh, I write the operas and my music is so loud because <laughs> there is too much noise out there, which is completely fake, but is in the form of a letter by Rossini. Mm. Is, the, is the fantasy that you can get to what people really think, really feel what they don't think, that the letter is, is, is so interesting about. Uh, and I'm really thankful to Barbara for being, bringing up what, um, um, in my work, is not the first time I, 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 I go to psychoanalysis. And it's usually sidestepped, you know, makes people slightly uncomfortable, most, most uh, reviewers. Are, and you, you go there, you talk about death and rebirth, um, and about us as well. I'm really gr very grateful. I absolutely love compromise formation. I think it's genius. I hadn't come, it had not <laughs> come to mind, but compromise formation is precisely what uh, these uh, works allow Italians to develop. Uh, and the compromise, of course, follows. You know, this is the, the, the work, the working through, if you want, is done through and thanks to Rossini's operas. But once you reach a position of compromise formation, then you move on. And it's astounding how quickly that happens. 1823 to 25, you know, where Rossini's operas go from being number one, the most performed in a matter of a few years, they come second and then third, very, very, very quickly. You are as if you are embarrassed, you know, how you have a love affair with somebody and then you change also, primarily thanks to that love affair. But after you have moved on, you look back, really? Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> mm, I spent so many years with that person. Uh, in, in that sense, <laughs> compromise formation is a bit what happened in the mid 1830s. To, to, to Italians or to Italians who, who went to the opera. So thank you. Wonderful formulation, compromise formation. Um, thank you also to Alessandro for his uh, contribution about semantics of time. Um, uh, there are many suggestions. Um, one, um, I would start, I would like to start on, uh, you said that Rossini's operas reflected, he used that word, they reflected a mood, a situation, emotions. And uh, I would rather say that they contributed to create. They mm. were a component mm. in an ongoing negotiation. Opera doesn't simply reflect society. It contributes, as, it, it gives as much as it takes. Uh, you learn about being an Italian, a person, a German, mm. a man, a woman, a straight person, a gay person, an old person, by going to the opera, as well as by reading novels, as well as by watching what other people do, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, they reflected, but also they contributed to that. Um, uh, you name Spaventa, you name Foscolo, you name Leopardi. Uh, I don't name, but I wish I had named Carlo Tenka, who is mm. also another contributor to this idea that Italians somehow put a footnote, <laughs> you know, lacked the means to deal with um, modernity. And Tenka is explicit in saying what is missing in Italy's literature, is literature that is read widely. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the, the business of rapture versus juncture is also very, very interesting. Um, in a sense, every rupture presupposes a juncture, or rather, um, if you conceive of an event or a series of events in terms of rupture, it means that you know what juncture is, mm? and vice versa. If you conceive in terms of juncture, then you know what, what rupture is. Uh, I think it's 
it's in this sort of um, tension or uh, dialectics between rupture and juncture that um, that emerges at that time. The, the, the consciousness that there are two options here, that there are two possible positions, say, at the end of a continuum, total rupture and total juncture. But it's then that people start to be able to conceive of time in terms of rupture and juncture. So since then, in Italy, we have been thinking in those terms and still continue to do. I'd say in Europe as well, not only Italy, in the West, if we are still allowed to, to speak in, in these terms. Um, so that seems to me particularly interesting. There is a narrative of rupture and this, there, in a, there is a narrative of juncture, but both are born there, were that made possible by what happens in Italy between 1796 and 1814, basically. Um, so, yeah, um, great suggestion. Uh, I, I wish I had said more about that in the book, but, you know, it's up for others to now to, to, to think about this. Uh, Catherine, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting and rich um, reflection. Um, escape, uh, it's a great... Uh, it's a great question. Um, which kind of spectatorship as, and we kind, which kind of audition? Uh, again, I wish I'd said more in the book about the type of aud aud audition as, as, as well as vision uh, this operas um, suggest, imply, presuppose, or something. Um, yeah, I think here again the uh, term, the crucial term is repetition. What happens when you know that something is always there? Even if you step away from it, even if you are not paying attention all the time, you know that it's there. If you miss it once, it will be back. Um, if we miss it the second time, it will be back again. Um, I'm not sure what Kind what happens, but I, 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 I'd suggest that some the possibility of getting in and out and counting on the possibility of the object always being being there is different. Absorption, um, <laughs> absorption implies fear. I want to say mm -hmm. fear that you miss something, mm -hmm. that if you don't stay with it, you miss a, a, a crucial bit. And, and, and with Rossini, you, you can relax back and count on the fact that it's always there, that there is a machine going to a rhythm that you can mimic if you want and not be in it. But it, there is no fear in repetition. You know, I, I'm not sure where this is going, but I think fear of missing out <laughs> you know, may, may play a role here. Um, about visuality more, more specifically, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what does the hyperrealism, or rather realism, of melodrama say has to say have to say about the kind of engage, visual engagement? And the uh, the basic answer is the simple answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, I mean, you, 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 of course you have noticed. I only talk about production about visuality when I talk about recent decades, mm -hmm. and I don't say. I don't say anything about mm. the visual visuality mm. of, of uh, Rossini's operas in the early 19th century. And I have a ready excuse for it, which I say in the book, is simply because um, um, nothing really changed. You know, I mean, in the sense that uh, with Rossini, a lot changed in the music, in the drama, but nothing really changed in the, um, on the, on, in the staging. And I think that is uh, too ready an answer. It's too quick. Um, if you if you read the what well, they thought at the time, uh, precisely the discourse is one of mimesis, a uh, constant and repeated. Uh, what the uh, stage designers went for was authenticity, was realism, was uh, absorption was you are not only supposed to marvel at what you say and say, oh, how beautiful, but rather you feel the emotions also thanks to the 
very realistic, very precise staging. Uh, so, which would seem to counter my argument completely. Um, except that then I think, uh, this goes back to my short trouser, the youth as a musicologist here, that uh, when, say, operas staged in the classical, in classical times were performed at La Scala, you recognize in the stage designs elements from the, very, from the theater, from the auditorium, mm -hmm. as in trying to create a kind of continuity, you know, the same type of columns that you see in the Rossini mm -hmm. March at La Scala, you see reproduced on stage as well. I'm not sure whether that also tries to uh, emphasize uh, a, 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 a realism, although uh, it's a strange kind of realism if you see the present in the past on stage. I'm, I'm not answering your question because it, I, I, I'm not able to answer it in so short time, but, it, but it's a very, very interesting one. I think um, work needs to be done by scholars of stage designs, of staging, on what exactly realism, absorption, theatricality, mimesis meant uh, in Just opera that. in Italy at the time. Uh, a lot of work has been done on melodrama, but not on melodrama in Italy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, because there was very little of it and whatever there was, that we, we don't know. So we, have, we know about France, we know about German-speaking countries, we know a lot about London or rather, you know, the Great Britain. Uh, we don't know very much about Italy, and it's understandable. So more work needs to be done on uh, practices of staging. For example, you talk about movement. <laughs> That's, you know, a video, video didn't exist. I'd love, I'd love to be able to say what went on in terms of gestures on stage. When the music repeated itself, did they repeat the gestures? I don't know. But thank you, great question. Um, uh, Axel, Italianita abroad. Again, thank you very much. Um, um, I think here about ideas of Italianita, and this is also what Alessandro um, was suggesting or implying, is where my, my book gets uh, really political, if you want. Um, I, I agree with what you say about De Stael's um, speaking about France when she's speaking about Italy and uh, when she seems where she's, she's ostensibly speaking about Italy and her um, orientalizing or not orientalizing view of Italians. Um, the, the, the point I was trying to make was that um, it, it is not only um, that these foreigners describe Italians in a certain way, but they um, are witnessed by Italians uh, watching them in that way. What really, I think, sort of supports my argument is that I don't, I don't quote only um, uh, novelists or mm -hmm. political theorists, but I, I quote um, sort of the mid-ranking, uh, I don't quote, I, I, I mm -hmm. quote Michael Burrs, who quotes mm -hmm. uh, uh, officials, you know, people who are not writing for public consumption, but the, for, for their bosses in Paris, mm -hmm. and saying things about Italy that uh, must have meant a certain way of looking at Italians, that Italians saw thread in their eyes, people from abroad looking at us in a way that tells us who we are. And I'm sorry we go back to uh, psychoanalysis in mm. the broadest possible mm. way conceived. We learn who we are by seeing what, what we see in other people looking at us, by understanding what other people do when they think or feel when they look at us. And that is where I think um, it, it, where, where my argument sort of hinges. Um, it's not that um, 
it's, it's that Italians uh, didn't have a sufficiently strong sense of themselves in the face of new events that they could that they could somehow learn from themselves who they were. It was this work of uh, seeing themselves in somebody else's eyes, looking at us, let me say us, and being seen watching. This mirror um, effect of, circu of circulating, of ping-ponging back and forth gazes that means that uh, you, in the end, are not quite sure where you stand in the end. Uh, if your sense of reality only comes from seeing somebody who watches you in a certain way. Uh, perhaps I'm not saying that Italians were orientalized. Perhaps I'm saying that they were considered or they felt as being, cons they were being considered uh, children, childish, you know, not yet fully developed in, in, in enough to project an image of themselves that came from within rather than taking it in what came from outside. Um, so basically, it's not what the style says, is what Italians make of what the styles and their contemporaries and their um, fellow French or, or, or fellow non-Italian had to say that uh, was internalized. Uh, it doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside mm -hmm. that which comes from outside, but doesn't come from outside in the first instance. It has been internalized and then rejected out. And again, uh, I would want uh, to emphasize the, um, mm, the temporal limitation of, of what we are talking about. It doesn't last that long, mm. really. Um, you make a compromise to go back to, to the mm. beginning at some point, and then things change. So um, what, uh, uh, what I see as problematic in a lot of um, history of 19th century Italian opera, in, even in, in the very idea of 19th century Italian opera, is that it seems like a self-contained object that, that uh, doesn't contemplate sufficient, a sufficient degree of change. I'm talking about a, a mental concept here, as if 19th century Italian opera were a, co a concept that sort of holds together chronologically as well. Which, which you, you mentioned, Rossini, Bellini, and Donizetti. Well, uh, things change enormously after around and after 1830, I think. So there is some justification in certain readings of Bellini and Donizetti's operas that is unjustified for Rossini's mm -hmm. operas. But really, we are talking about 20 years at the most, and then a different generation comes on, a different set of beliefs, a different attitude towards um, political action, political impact, uh, notions of self, and so on and so forth. And what is um, surprising is how quickly things change, I think. How quickly Rossini really goes out of fashion in a, in a, in a way that um, is the first time that something lasts so long and at the same time disappears so quickly. So it's clearly something very, very important in terms, to, in terms of time and duration is happening around those, those decades. And Rossini's operas and the way in which they have this enormous success and then they very quickly disappear, I think is a point of view that has proven or you know, seems to be particularly fruitful uh, in, in this respect. I will shut up. Thank you very much again, and I hope I, yeah, yeah, I hope I've made sense. <laughs> Emanuel, thank you for engaging so closely with our thoughts, our ideas about your book. It would be wonderful if we could now do another round where we respond to your comment on our comments, but um, we want to be more democratic than that and would like to open for questions from the floor and also I really encourage people in the wider audience outside Leipzig to come in with comments, questions, their thoughts about what we try to produce with this round. Mm -hmm.
table. Um, yes, just just as a bit of filler, I was I was thinking about your response to my response, and it was mm. making me think about Susan Rutherford's work on Judith Pasta and her style of coordinating movements with music. And of course, she started that with Rossini and then transferred it to Bellini, and, and then the shift between her performance style and, and Manor Brands. And yeah, I mean, I was, uh, it's not a question, it was just, you know, a, a follow-on that, yeah, some of, this, some of this work has started and that actually that's a performance style actually quite similar to what we talk about in melodrama, you know, with that sort of excessive representation or lining up of all the, all the parameters. Um, yeah, so that was just a, a further contribution. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because it somehow um, lines up in a way with my suggestion that in and out mm. is the kind of engagement you can have. Because what seems to have happened with pasta is that uh, it was a sort of a kind of Tai Chi kind of acting. You know, you hold something still, a pose still, and then mm -hmm. you make a gesture, mm -hmm. and then you stop. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And then again, you make it a, a, yeah. a, a very impactful que uh, gesture, which is impactful precisely because you haven't moved for yeah. a while, mm -hmm. and. Uh, what do you do in between yeah. gestures? Uh, how you fill the time? Do you stand still? Do you repeat gestures? How do you repeat them and so on and so forth? The very fact that her acting style was noticed as different mm. implies that people did perhaps something else. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the question, uh, the crucial question remains, what did people do on stage during those enormously long, slow movements in, when, in which they repeat over and over the same music and the yeah. same words. Did they stand still? Was it the equivalent of a melodramatic tableau? Yeah, I mean, Pasta, in that account of, of her, always seems to be a sort of hangover from 18th century styles that actually, you know, people like Garrick earlier in the 18th century had moved away from, and she seems to have revived a little. But also the way you were describing it then just made me think, you know, that's another example of something that's both artificial in the way we criticise melodrama, but also mimetic, like mm. absolutely mm. mimetic in intention, you know, it yeah. combines those, those two things. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With regard to these orientalizing debates, I think the problem is partly that because of an academic paradigm, we have been mostly looking for authors who um, Orientalize Italians, and if you look for it, historians always find what they look for. That's one of the problems of this profession. I don't mean by that just historians in the sense of people doing history like Ranko or so, anybody who engages with the past. You find what you're looking for, and I think this has very much shaped debates and conceptions in a not very fortunate way in recent years. Of course, you are much more inter in interested in this internalizing of orientalizing practices. And of course, if we look for that, we find that again. Um, but um, I have to say, in a lot of work that I did about how Italians engage with the wider world, I found also um, it, many Italians who did not internalize the orientalizing of themselves by others. And I don't know, these, this, this way, for instance, to pick up just one example, which I studied for a while, is um, the engagement with the new world um, in Italy. It was not this moment of blind admiration of everything that, hap that, that happened there only because we are so inferior and we have been told um, that we are inferior. Very often, I find actually very self-consciously acting um, Italians who can engage with something like that, but not in the way, oh, we should be like them. And um, this would be the way to overcome our problems and so on. And I think we have been shaped a bit too much by um, a debate that has picked up this paradigm. And I wonder also why we are so, um, so, de so dependent on doing this orientalizing thing with Italians. I, I wonder if it doesn't if it doesn't say more about us as a generation or two or three generations by now of scholars, um, because we could do this also. You probably, if you found um, these debates about 
the French and France after the defeat of Napoleon or after the defeat, defeat of Napoleon III, we could probably construct a very similar paradigm, but we are not doing that. And with Italians, we always return to that argument. I think we have to move on from that. That's my criticism of the scholarship of Dinotto. And in a way, probably your work that you have now done on the way how Italians engage with Rossini shows that actually something much more interesting is happening in Italy in these Napoleonic years um, as well that goes beyond this pattern that we have come, that we have become accustomed to so much. Yeah, I think uh, the interesting um, question to ask is um, ab about us or recent generations. Um, and I don't have the answer, but it's, 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 about, it's about the present in all sorts of ways, or, or the recent past. Mm. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, there, uh, there, is, um, there is something that makes that type of behavior or the type of belief mm. um, easier to deal with than others. Mm. You know? I mean, the question would be, what does this, kind, this set of beliefs facilitate? What does it make possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, what does it uh, uh, prevent us from feeling, from thinking? Mm -hmm. Which kind of work? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I always go back to that. With, with psycho, we kind of psycho, psycho emotional work does mm -hmm. finding this kind of uh, information and not other information. Mm -hmm. Tell us, mm -hmm. why do we look for it? Mm -hmm. There are historiographical traditions, of course. Mm -hmm. There are evident political mm -hmm. uh, implications mm -hmm. in doing one or the other. But beyond those, there is certain, mm -hmm. um, some deep-seated uh, psycho-emotional work that seeing yourself in a certain way, or rather, mm -hmm. um, discursivizing yourself in a certain way mm -hmm. makes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in all sorts of ways, it shouldn't be Italians. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the patience, mm. you know, mm. uh, you tell us <laughs> what we are trying to avoid, you know. <laughs> Basically, we go from an aesthetics of wonder in the 18th century, I'm, I'm grossly simplifying here, but uh, from an aesthetics of wonder to an aesthetics of uh, absorption. This is the narrative of the uh, most significant scholar of and state in, in scenography for Italian opera, Mercedes Viale Ferrero, a wonderful Italian scholar. She recently died, she was very old, um, who um, uh, tells the story of Italian state design as a move from wonder to absorption. To you, you say how beautiful, you go from saying how beautiful to saying how affecting. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, in order to reach this, she says, uh, the uh, main device is the, an increasing degree of precision. So that uh, uh, is basically through realism, you reach uh, the hearts of the audience. But this starts, as far as state designs are concerned, before Rossini, well before. She already sees that in the 1790s. Uh, I know because I worked a long time ago on state designs for La Clemenza di Tito and Mozart's La Clemenza di Tito. Um, so uh, that apparently begins with uh, also post-French Revolution, post-Napoleonic years, I mean, the, 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 during the Napoleonic years. But as I said, it doesn't start be with Rossini, it starts before Rossini. And that is a, it's a long durée process. It takes decades. So that the apex of Italian uh, state design in the initial decades of the 19th century is Alessandro Sanquirico, who is the main scenographer at La Scala from Rossini's time up to the late 1830s. And is the first stage, it designs the, the uh, Casaladra for Rossini, for example, but he also designs Norma. He also designs Anna Bolena, you know, all those Bellini and Donizetti operas. Um, and in a sense, there is a sense in which uh, the discourse, the standard discourse of opera is one of absorption, is one of involvement, emotional involvement. 
In this sense, Rossini is the odd man out. Um, the, the, the historiography of Italian opera from, I don't know, let, leave Monteverdi aside, from Pergolesi to Puccini, in a sense, is a history of progressive rapprochement between words and music. You know, the music pays ever more attention to the words, so that in Puccini they are, it looks like it's a movie, basically, it's straight theater, you know. The music has become, has adheres to the world so closely that the, that the dramaturgy, the theatrical rhythm of a Puccini opera is exactly the same as the rhythm of an Ibsen play. And there is no difference, basically. In this narrative, Rossini is the odd man out. It's very, very difficult because he does exactly the opposite. Now, what I don't know enough is whether we can see something similar in the historiography of Italian stage design, which is also a historiography, a progressive history, if you want, a progressive rapprochement between what you see on stage and what you see uh, you know, in, in, in the theater. I don't know enough to, see, to say whether at some point corresponding with Rossini's uh, career, there are um, pushes towards a distanciation. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure exactly how to interpret those columns. Again, this goes back to Clemenza di Tito, Mozart, which was performed at La Scala the first time in 1816, in 1818, something, 1819, perhaps something like that. Now, there's some critical stage designs from La Scala. Of course, Clemenza di Tito takes place in 79, 79. And the, uh, La Scala is a neoclassical architecture. So if you have a Roman mm. times on stage, a neoclassical auditorium, and you prolong the same uh, architectural elements, mm. what are you doing to spectatorship and visuality? Yeah. Are you suggesting that they are us, that they, we are like them, and therefore are you suggesting that you're establishing a connection? Or are you, are you just saying, oh, that's just theater? You know, mm. it's not reality. Yes, I mean, we are in a theater and we see theater. You know, this is not our architecture. This is the architecture of the theater. Uh, I'm not sure. The answer is, I don't know. You can construe it in one way or another. But um, uh, I think is if there is a counter narrative to that weak historiography of Italian state design is uh, some, somewhere there in where you play with mirrors as opposed to with the kind of realism that we can understand for Verdi or Puccini, so to speak. Um, in this respect, I want to say that I can already hear some Italian reviews of my book. I haven't read anything. I mean, it's just too early. They haven't come out. That I bet you that somebody will say Rossini is not quite like that is not quite so um, forgetful of the words. He's, he doesn't quite ignore them as much as Senici says. Because if you conceive of opera, of good opera, as a piece of art, art that uh, fuses words and music, if that is your basic, the way you have been trained to think of how opera works, then uh, Rossini is an outlier. Rossini is a not, not a good opera composer. He's not good. Huh? Um, and um, what my, my answer would be, it's not me, it's them. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Meyerbeer in 1818 saying, the third act of Otello is wonderful. And that's all the more surprising because it's completely un mm -hmm. And lo and behold, Gosset in the in Grove in the in the in the, in the um, entry Rossini in, in, in the Grove Dictionary of Musical Musicians says in the third act of Otello Rossini came of age as a musical dramatist mm. <laughs> in the most un what Meyerbeer considered the most un Rossinian mm. of, of music mm. so you see if you if you want the words and the music to go together. Then yes, then the third act of Otello is when your Rossini grows up eventually, becomes a mature composer. Mm -hmm. But 
my remember was saying that's surprising because Rossini is not like that, mm. you know, and saying that uh, Rossini grew up, came of age, became a, an adult composer, a mature composer with the third act of Otello, is saying that Barbaro Seville, Tancredi, Italiana are the works of an immature musical mm. dramatist, of an underage composer. I don't know what to do with this duality, basically, but I would like to do something similar, in a sense. I would like to be able to construct an argument by which is not just a narrative of rapprochement between reality and representation, but there are ways in which reality and representation are questioned. So I don't know, but I know what I would like to say. <laughs> so if Emanuele wrote the most important book, not on Rossini, but on what people did with Rossini, how they understood Rossini um, um, for a very long time, then our discussion shows how much else he could write about related topics. And he also gives us a wonderful agenda of what other people could write about and, and how, how the discussion should I, go I, on, yeah. what composers we should um, link, how we should link the audiences of these composers together, and also thinking about our speculation, what the critics might say about the book. I mean, they reviews must come out relatively soon if you think that it's um, already now a certain time since um, it came out with Chicago. But um, considering all that, this is certainly a debate that has to go on. And um, I think at this stage, we are just very grateful to Emanuela for having written this book, having shared his ideas with us. We have been waiting um, for this book for a long time, and we can now use it to think on from where Emanuele brought us, that's a wonderful um, situation to be in. So let's all thank Emanuele again, and I thank, of course, also the contributors to the round table. I thank again Recent Globe, La Fondazione, and also the Bolletino. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.